Open your Bibles, the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 30. We're thankful for each of you that are in the service tonight. And uh, my, I realize, like Dr. C, that there's any number of places you could be on a Tuesday night. But here you are in the house of God with the people of God getting ready to hear the Word of God. Some of you have not even had dinner yet. Some of you had a quick bite to eat. Many of you came right from maybe work or school or running an errand. And again, there's just different places, a hundred different places at least that you could be tonight. But thank you, thank you, thank you for being in the revival meeting. Appreciate these preachers that are here. Thank you, men of God, for coming. I'm always honored and humbled when God's good men give me a night to be with me in a revival meeting or in a conference. So appreciate all of the singing. And I believe the special music has set the stage, so to speak, for the preaching of the Word of God tonight. 1 Samuel chapter 30. As you're turning there, a number of years ago now, I had the privilege, and I wouldn't uh, trade it for this auditorium filled with $100 bills. I had the privilege of preaching with one of my heroes, Dr. Lee Robertson. In fact, it would have been... Uh, Oh, some 25 plus years ago next week that I preached with Dr. Robertson at the great Gospelite Baptist Church in Walkertown, North Carolina for the National Sword of the Lord Conference. I'll be preaching there next week as well. But I remember preaching with Dr. Robertson and uh, I was already, Dr. C, listening very closely. I was listening very carefully. Dr. Robertson was in his 90s then, and I mean, I just uh, was seated on the edge of my seat. If they would have been charging seats, uh, they'd only have to charge me half price because I was sitting on the edge of mine. I wanted to hear what that giant, that giant for God and good had to say that night. And Dr. Robertson made this statement, 90 plus years of age, and he said, if I had to do my ministry all over again. I would preach more encouraging sermons. You know, from time to time, the people of God need messages of strength and messages of solace and messages of stanima. Some would have us believe that every time a preacher stands to preach, they all skin people. I've never believed that. In fact, if you skin anything, you're going to kill it. I don't believe in skinning people when I preach. On the heels of that, let me say that I do believe in shearing the sheep awfully close, but I don't believe in skinning them. And so with the help of the Lord, I want to try to bowl down that alley tonight. 1 Samuel chapter number 30, and I'll begin reading with verse number 3 through verse number 10 where we find the text to the message. And I would invite you to stand with me as I read the Word of God. 1 Samuel chapter 30, beginning with verse number 3 through verse number 10. Let me make mention that tomorrow night, and uh, I'm a little melancholy in saying it. Every time I use that word melancholy, I think about a girl I dated in high school. She had a head like a melon and a face like a collie. That's funnier than you're letting on. And uh, I'm, a little bit, I'm a little bit melancholy when I make this uh, statement. Uh, tomorrow night is the last night of the revival meeting. If the Lord should stay is coming, and uh, I've so enjoyed these days. And if the Lord uh, should stay is coming, I don't often announce what I'm going to preach before I preach it. But I feel strangely impressed to announce that tomorrow night, the Lord being my helper, I'll preach on the subject, just keep plowing. Amen. You don't want to miss the service tomorrow night. Just keep plowing. In fact, if I had to choose between tonight and tomorrow night, I wouldn't even come tonight. I'd come tomorrow night. But you're here, so you might as well go ahead and stay. 1 Samuel chapter number 30. Now listen, I've given you enough time to find 1 Samuel chapter 30. If you haven't found it by now, wherever you are in that hymn book, 
just pretend that you're at 1 Samuel chapter 30, beginning with verse number 3 through verse number 10. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, and Hinoam, the Jezreelites, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. Now, I'm not going to preach entirely from this fifth verse that's found here in this uh, 30th chapter of the book of 1 Samuel. I cannot read it without making some type of a comment. I'm not a prophet, nor the son of a prophet, but I know right now what you're wondering. You look at that verse and you're wondering about uh, that two wives business. That's what you're wondering about. But when I look at that verse, I wonder about that two mother-in-law business. That's what I wonder about. And all God's sweet little children said, <laughs> they said, ouch, that's what they said. Verse 6, and David was greatly distressed. For the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest and Himelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought hither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So David went, he and the six hundred men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and four hundred men, for two hundred abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Besor. Please look back with me at verse number 8. 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse number 8. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and thou fail, recover all. Amen. Now in this verse, there are two questions. Twice we find in one verse two question marks. Question one, shall I pursue after this troop? Question two, shall I overtake them? They bump into one another. They bang into one another. And it's from those two question marks that I want to speak to you on the subject tonight when you don't know what to do. Amen. Huh. Amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Amen. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this privilege to stand behind a sacred desk to preach the Word of God. If in my heart I want to be a blessing, but the only way that I can be is if you hide me behind the cross and fill me with the Spirit. Place a hedge around this great church by the blood of Christ to keep the devil and his demons from hindering this service. Save the sinner and stir the saint. Heavenly Father, for all that you'll do in our midst and even in our hearts tonight, we will be careful to give you all the praise and honor and glory. Bless and protect my precious family as I am away. Give us fresh warm bread from the oven of heaven to feed from tonight. And Lord, I request, oh, how I would request that you'd clothe me in my calling. 
For we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So good to see my dear friend with the Tyson slip in and one of his men. Thank you so much for coming a great distance in rush hour. And I appreciate you being in the revival meeting. During the spiritual life of every saint, there will be those seasons when they'll search their souls about the direction of their next step. It may be at the foot of a high mountain or at the entrance of a low valley. It is in these heart-moving hours that God desires to change your question marks in to exclamation points when you don't know what to do. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 30, we find the Amalekites spoil Ziklag. Now this chapter could be easily or effortlessly, Brother Good, outlined like this, the result of the siege, verses 1 through 2. The remorse of the survivors, verses 3 through 5. The reaction of the soul leader, verses 6 through 10. The reviving of the servant, Verses 11 through 15. The rout of the soldiers. Verses 16 through 17. The rescue of the siblings. Verses 18 through 20. And then the redistribution of the spoils. Verses 21 through 31. It is well the prophet Nathan is dealing under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit with the reaction of the soul leader that a person sees that David, oh my, was uncertain concerning what his next course of action should be. Verse 8, and David inquired at the Lord, saying, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I <coughs> overtake them? Never forget, there will be times in the life of every believer when they'll truly be tentative about what their next direction or what their next decision ought to be. Now, if you miss everything that I preach tonight, I pray that you would not miss that. And it even bears repeating. There will be times. There will be times. There will be times in the life of every believer when they'll truly be tentative about what their next direction or what their next decision ought to be. You see, if David faced a time when he didn't know what to do, I'll face a time when I don't know what to do. If David faced a time that he didn't know what to do, you will face a time that you do not know what to do. If David faced a time that he didn't know what to do, then all of us will face a time when we don't know what to do. But I'm glad and I'm grateful that when those moments come that we don't know what to do, when we come to those places, when we come to those points of time, when we come to those periods where we don't know what to do, there is the exhortation and there is the example of David to do what we don't know what to do. Uh, friend, you and I should follow the wonderful example of Brother David when we're uncertain about what uh, our next course of action should be. Now looking into 1 Samuel chapter 30, I want to note uh, tonight uh, several outstanding things. In fact, there are three that David did that the believer can do when we don't have any idea what to do. Again, let me say, circle the field and buzz the tower again. There's going to be that point. There's going to be that period of time. There's going to be that place when you don't know what to do. I mean, think about it for a moment. We're considering uh, the sweet psalmist of Israel. We're considering the one who wrote the songbook or the hymn book of the Bible. We're considering the one, oh my, who was known as a man after God's own heart. And he got to a place. He got to a point of time. He got up to a period when he didn't know what to do. So we'll be there as well. 
Quickly, let's notice tonight three outstanding things that David did that the believer can do when we don't have any idea what to do. You may want to take out a pencil and somewhere in your Bibles scratch these things down. But my, how it would be far better if God were to take an eternal pen and write these things upon my heart and upon your heart as well when you don't know what to do. Number one, pray. Verse 7, and David said to Abiathar the priest and Himelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought hither the ephod to David. The believers should pray when they don't know what to do. In verse 7, the prophet Nathan tells us that the same minute David sees the empty city of Ziklag, smells the smoke of the burning buildings, sounds of weeping of the troops, and senses the violent uprising, that he requests the priest Abiathar to bring to him the ephod. The Bible is a book of divine detail. And everything that's in the Bible is supposed to be in the Bible. Amen. And you do understand that God never put in extra words to fatten a verse. And God never put extra words to fatten a chapter. I may not understand everything that is in the Bible, but I do understand that everything that's in the Bible is supposed to be in the Bible. The ephod was a portion of the high priest's garments which speaks of prayer. It was in two pieces, the one for the back and the other for the breast. The two pieces were joined by shoulder pieces which, uh, Mother Tyson, were a continuation of the front part of the ephod. On the shoulder pieces were two uh, precious stones, each having the names of the six tribes of Israel. These stones were placed in gold settings, which some think may clasp. For fastening the shoulder pieces together, the two parts of the ephod were fastened around the body by means of a girdle, which was really a portion of the front part of the ephod. Again, the ephod was a portion of the high priest's garments, which speaks of prayer. Amen. David must be commended here for making his first decision a decision to pray. Mark it down, whatever the saints of first response to a problem reveals the real depth of their spirituality. Friend, you and I must pray when we don't know what to do. The Bible says in Psalm 18.6, In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry came before him even into his ears. Can I go ahead and preach tonight? <laughs> you asked for it. Most Christians, when they face any pressing consternation, perplexing calamity, or personal catastrophe, pick up their telephone and speed dial all their family and friends to tell them about it, or they plaster it. Don't bow your head while I'm preaching tonight. Or they plaster it and post it all over social media don't you think that the great heart of the heavenly father must be grieved as he watches his children tell everyone and their dog about their questions difficulties and tragedies before they ever uttered a single word to him you see when we don't know what to do there is the exhortation when we don't know what to do there is the example of David and when we don't know what to do we can pray During World War II, under a pile of government buildings and Story's Gate, off of Whitehall, London, a vast subterranean quarters with over 150 rooms were in daily use. Some called it the hole. In it were a map room with a great map of the world and its sea routes, a cabinet room where the enemy strategy was debated by the leading strategist, a telephone room 
a key room for the, peop for the purpose of holding regular communications with other rulers and all in secret. But it was the great statesman, Dr. C. Winston Churchill, that refused to call it the whole and always referred to it as the secret place. Hey, Christian, uh, why don't you, when you don't know what to do next, uh, move as swiftly as you can uh, to your secret place uh, to tell that one who has bended ear, who can really do something about what you're up against, what you're going through, and what what you're facing. What do we do when we don't know what to do? We can pray. Number two. I'm going to get stuck here. Number two. Pursue. Verse eight. And David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and thou fail, recover all. You see, the believer uh, should pursue when they don't know what to do. In verse 8, the prophet Nathan tells us that it was while David was meeting with God uh, that he's told to move after his family and his soldiers' families. God makes this crystal clear, uh, Brother Strine, uh, by saying to David, pursue. Uh, that was the go sign. Uh, this word in the Hebrew language, it means to run after. Friend, you and I must pursue when we don't know what to do. It was Oliver Wendell Holmes who once said, to reach the port, we must sail. Sometimes with the wind, and sometimes against it. But we must sail, not drift or lie at anchor. How many times, preachers, have we seen God's good children? And I'm not being harsh. God knows my heart. But we've seen God's good children come to this place, come to this period of time, come to this point where David's at in 1 Samuel 30. And so they don't know what to do. And instead of keeping it in drive, they put it in neutral. Instead of keeping it in drive, they put it in park. Instead of keeping it in drive, they put it in reverse. And friend, when we don't know what to do, that, that's not the time to put it in neutral. In fact, I'll tell you the time to put it in neutral. It's one word. It starts with an N. Uh, it ends with an R. Uh, and ever goes in the middle. Never should we put it in neutral. But I've seen many a good child of God. Let me, let me just say in passing, there are going to be things that will happen in your life that you weren't prepared for. And there's going to be things that happen in your life that don't happen because you're backslid on God. Hello? <laughs> was to see, I said that the other night at the conference I was preaching. I said, hello. And a lady in the back row said, goodbye. And got up and walked out. <laughs> can't believe Mrs. Hamlin did that to me. I can't believe she did that. Don't text her and tell that. No, don't you do that. Too late. Already did. But I've seen God's good children just, just get broadsided by something. That's going to happen. You know, you're going to be serving God, and you're going to be standing for God, and, and you're going to be doing right. I'm not talking about being backslidden. I'm not talking about being out of the will of God. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, running on the edge. But you'll be doing right yes. and get sucker punched. You'll be doing right, and, and I mean, out of nowhere, something's going to happen. Out of nowhere, something's going to take place. And it's not like you haven't been reading your Bible. It's not like you've been laying out of the revival meeting. It's not like you've been living one way on Sunday and Monday through Saturday a totally different way. 
It's not like you've been playing church to the best of your ability. You've been living for God. And something's going to happen out of nowhere. I plead with you. Don't put it neutral. I plead with you. Don't put it in park. I, I plead with you. Don't put it in reverse. But pursue. But pursue. But pursue. You see, I'm, I'm not a great Christian by what I do on the mountaintop. I'm not a great Christian by what I do, by what I do and everything's going my way. I'm, I'm not a great Christian uh, when everything just, I mean, I've got the wind at my back and uh, every day is uh, just another blessing, uh, another favor, uh, another benefit. I'm, I'm not a good Christian during those times. Uh, I'm a good Christian when I can serve God when things aren't going good. Preach on, Dr. Hamlin, preach on. Amen. So you may be here tonight and you're going through something that, that you didn't predict and nobody could have predicted it. You may be going through something tonight that you had no idea was on the horizon of your life. It's interesting to me, you go through the Bible and you find some of the greatest Christians on the pages of the Bible who carried the biggest burdens. Don't shout me down while I'm preaching good. Who carried some of the biggest burdens. And you find some people on the pages of the Bible, I mean, they had heartache after heartache after heartache, not because they were bad, oh my, but because they were best. That's why we should never say stupid things when somebody in the church is going through something. That's why we should never say when Some of these kids go crazy. Oh, they must be hypocrites. No, you must be an idiot for saying that right there. That's such good preaching, sir. I'm going to sign that Gideon Bible in the nightstand of my motel room in room none of your business. I'm going to sign it when I get to the room. (laughs) Listen, when somebody goes through something, don't, don't, don't you think you know what it is? Don't, don't you try to prophesy? Don't you try to act like they did something bad or they're backslid on God. You could miss that by 10 million miles. You could miss it. I'm preaching to somebody tonight that you're going through something you didn't plan, you didn't expect. It was not on your planner for this week, for this month, maybe even for this year. But here's a word from the Lord. Pursue. 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 Brother Good, I've got kind of a goal in my Christian life, and my goal is to never telegraph what I'm going through. Now, I know that's the antithesis of what goes on today, because now if you just get a spiritual paper cut, you're supposed to ask that you'd be placed in the Fox Book of Martyrs, (laughs) and you're not even dead yet. But here's my goal, Brother Good. To never telegraph what I'm going through. Never, 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 never telegraph what I'm going through. Never. Never. That's right. (laughs) And if you'd ever get out, Mrs. C, I want somebody to be able to look back on a timeline and say, okay, he was going through that, and he's preaching that annual summer revival meeting at Frederick Baptist, and you mean to tell me he had that on him? And preach like that? Years ago, Brother John Mark, and I, and I hate when you give a story that you've got to preface it. I hate that. A, a lot of stories, would be, they'd be much shorter if you didn't have to preface everything. But if you don't preface it, everybody reads into it. So you've got to take about five minutes and preface this story. <laughs> Come on now. A number of years ago, there was a fundamental magazine. Please hang on every word. 
I did not say a newspaper. I said a magazine. A fundamental magazine, it's no longer in existence. So now we've settled, it's a magazine, and Dr. Tyson, it's no longer in existence, it's not a newspaper. And the editor called me one day, and of course I was in a meeting, and he said, Dr. Hamlin, he said, we would like to interview Mrs. Hamlin about the home going of her mother and brother so many years ago in that tragic automobile accident. Over 35 years ago now, on a Monday morning, my mother-in-law was taking my brother-in-law to the Christian school. It was in January. They hit a patch of black ice. For the good, they weren't going very fast. Uh, the accident reconstructionists figure about 35 miles an hour. When she lost control of her vehicle and went into the other lane, and a small truck, probably like in the Ranger family, T-boned my mother-in-law and brother-in-law, and instantly they went to heaven. And so this editor of a fundamental magazine, and not a newspaper, magazine, calls me. And he said, Dr. Hamlin, we'd like to interview Mrs. Hamlin about, about that tragedy and how she has dealt with it and how she'd been such a good example and what the Lord used to get her through that. And we'd, we'd, like, to, we'd like to interview her if that's all right with you. And I, Dr. C., I just, just said, she's a big girl. She can answer for herself. I'll give you her number. You can call her. You don't have to ask me. Hello? I didn't marry a toddler. Yeah. Say amen right there. I said, she's a big girl. You don't have to ask me. You can call her and ask her yourself. I said, I will tell you this. I'll give you a heads up. She's going to say no. Now, she'll appreciate it, Brother Tyson, but she's going to say no. And I said, the reason she's going to say no is because we have a philosophy in our house we try to live by, and that is when we, when we go through something, we don't talk about it. We just don't talk about it. And we try to find other people that are going through things that are rougher than what we're going through. We try to help them. Because we've discovered if we can help them, God helps us. By the way, the altar's open. Yeah. It's open. The altar's open. Amen. Boy, that would cut out a whole lot of belly aching. And that, that cut out a whole lot of, woe is me, I think I'll eat a worm and die. And that would uh, preach on, Dr. Hamlin, preach on. Uh, that would cut out a whole lot of uh, milking people's sympathies on social media. Yeah. It cut all that out. I said, but you're welcome to call her. Now, Mrs. C., I probably, as I look back on it, I probably should have given her the heads up, but I didn't. And so the editor of the Fundamental Magazine called her and asked her for an interview. And at dinner that night, <laughs> I didn't give her the heads up. At dinner that night, she said, uh, I, get, I get a phone call from Dr. So-and-so, and he wanted to interview me about Mom and Tim going to heaven. And, and I was honored, and I told him that, but I just said, you know, Dr. Hamlin and I, we have, we have a philosophy we try to live by, and that is we don't talk about what we're going through, and we try to help other people with what they're going through, and we have found if we can help other people, whoop goes right there with what they're going through. She didn't say whoop goes right there. I did. Uh, if we can help other people with what they're going through, God helps us. Amen. And she said, I told him, I'll give you an interview on being a preacher's daughter. I'll, I'll give you an interview on being an evangelist's wife. I'll, I'll give you an interview on uh, being a church uh, pianist. I mean, but, but as far as what, what uh, Dr. Hamlin and I have gone through in the home going of my mother and brother suddenly and tragically, she said, I, we just don't talk about what we're going through. Amen. Amen. I can prove what I'm preaching tonight. That member of the Frederick Baptist Church, that every time you come, if your path should intersect with theirs, you're always blessed because of it. Now, it doesn't have to be a long conversation. 
It doesn't have to be a drawn out conversation. But there are individuals in this church that if in any service your path should intersect with theirs, you're always better because of a short exchange. And 100% of the time, those are the people that carry a burden that would bust a bridge. But there's such an encouragement. Amen. Amen. That's right. Since last time I was here, Brother Brown graduated to glory. He's my buddy. Brother Brown stills my buddy. First time I preached here years ago, I'll never forget it. He and Mrs. Brown walked up to me and said, Dr. Hamlin, he said, we are members of First Baptist Church in Hammond, Indiana. And he said, Dr. Hiles is a sharp dresser. And he said, I believe you're a sharper dresser than he is. <laughs> He's my buddy. <laughs> And since I was here, Brother Good, last year, Brother Brown graduated to glory. Amen. And I made a mental note that I was going to find Mrs. Brown and hug her neck and tell her I've been praying for and, and thank God for heaven. And we'll be with Brother Brown longer than we're away from him. Amen. And before I could find her, she found me. Once you quit whining, why don't you quit whimpering? Amen. Just might be what you're going through, God can use to help somebody else. Amen. As I talk to that dear saint of God by the book table Sunday morning, sure she misses her husband, sure she thinks about him every day, but even though her heart is broken, there was victory, Amen. and there's the assurance that we're going to see him again. Man, we, we act like, woe is me, I think I'll eat a worm and die. We, we act like the Bible's a book of blank pages. We act like there's no heaven. We act like, friend, listen, when we go through things, it just might be to help somebody else that's going through something a whole lot bigger. Have an empathetic spirit. Now that, that right there will keep you off Facebook six months. Amen. Amen. It's constant, constant, constant. Woe's me, woe's me, woe's me, woe's me, woe's me, woe's me. It's constant. We all can do that. Yeah. <laughs> I had my heart set on a beautiful new pen today. Heart set on it. And Brother Strine picked me up and took me to a pen store that's just, just within walking distance of the White House. There would have been a national event yeah, if so-and-so would have been there, and I'd have been there too. <laughs> but he's wandering around somewhere in England, doesn't even know where he is. But man, my heart was set, and, and, and Mrs. Hamlin called me. She knew I was going to go today, and she was excited for me. And, and, and man, I, my heart was set. And Brother Strine, I mean, we got in and got out. And while I'm on that, let me get on this. If you ever need a good getaway driver, a good getaway driver. <laughs> it's on that platform. I mean, he got me into Washington, D.C. He got me out of absolutely seamless. Got me right to that world famous Dr. Tyson pen store. I've bought pens there through the years. And dropped me off and I went to the door and had a big old sign, homemade sign on it, said close, no air conditioning. Do you see where I posted that on social media? Did you see it? Maybe it didn't come up in your thread. Do you see where I said, woe is me? <laughs> Give me a stinking break. You know what that's called? It's called life. Actually, it's called Mrs. Hamlin's prayer life. Because she said, go and get something nice, but she's praying. It's her prayer life is what that was. What I'm, what I'm trying to say tonight, when things happen in your life and you don't know what to do, please, I plead with you, please, 
Don't put it in neutral. Don't put it in park. Don't put it in reverse. Keep it in drive. And that's exactly what David did. David pursued. Now there are several things that a believer should follow after. No matter what they're going through in life, it may shock you, stun you, and even surprise you. But first of all, right living, Isaiah 51.1, hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock when ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit when ye are digged, a, a thing that God desires the believer to follow after, no matter what they're going through in life, uh, is right living. Whenever the redeemed heads towards righteousness, they'll always reach a closer relationship with God. Secondly, right loving, 1 Corinthians 14, 1, follow after charity, a thing that God desires the believer to follow after. No matter what they're going through in life, is right loving. Actions that are inspired by authentic admiration will always make better a home, a marriage, and a church. Right loving. Thirdly, right lifting. Romans 14, 19, let us therefore follow after things which make for peace, the things wherewith one may edify another, a thing that a believer, that God desires the believer to follow after, no matter what they're going through in life, uh, is right lifting. The Christian will never come to a place where they can't think of anyone uh, that could not use some encouragement. You realize you don't have to travel miles to find somebody that needs to be encouraged. You, you only have to take a, a couple steps to find somebody that needs to be encouraged. You don't have to fill out uh, an application form to be an encourager. You don't have to have a background check to be an encourager. You don't have to go to Bible college to be an encourager. You can be an encourager tonight. And I've just made an observation. If I can help you with what you're going through today, Amen. you might be the one that helps me with what I'm going through, what I'm going through tomorrow. That's right. Last I checked, we're in this thing together. Last I checked, you need me. Oh, what an arrogant statement. Well, you didn't let me finish it. And I need you. And we need one another. Amen. Sunday morning, I got to preach. And as I was reading my text, this young man right here, I glanced down and he went, Amen. I think he's trying to encourage me. Maybe that means don't preach long. I don't know. <laughs> that encouraged me. I went on the property five minutes and more than I can count. More members of this church than I can count welcomed me. Amen. And said they're praying for me and praying for the meeting. Amen. I preach in some places not often and I'm not there for that so it doesn't matter. But I preach in some places where man they're happier when I leave than when I get there. And that's, that's immaterial. I'm not, for that. I'm not there for that anyhow. But it sure is a blessing. When a teenager on the front row, by the way, you do know these are all future death row inmates. <laughs> and serial killers on the second row. <laughs> but it blessed my heart when I was reading the text. And a young man a thumbs up. Amen. Before I came to the platform to preach for the shrine, shot me a text message, a picture of his daughter and son-in-law in Honduras. And they're watching the services. Yeah. And they sent me a picture of his granddaughter watching me preach on the other side of the world. He didn't have to do that, but encourage me. 
Now, I know what you're thinking right now. I know exactly what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, nobody ever encourages me. (laughs) That is not an indictment on everybody. That's an indictment on you. Because if you will be an encourager, you will be encouraged. Right lifting. I wonder what an email from you would do for somebody. I wonder what a post on social media would do for someone. I wonder what a text would do for someone. I wonder what shaking somebody's hand and leaving a picture of a dead president would do for somebody. Oh, I wish somebody would do that for me. You're missing the whole message. In fact, I'm tempted to just go back to the beginning and re-preach it. I wish somebody would come to the altar and pray with me. Who have you prayed at the altar with? Well, I wish somebody would make a big deal on something new in my life. When's the last time you made a big deal about something new in somebody else's life? Two preachers, friends of mine, don't say one younger, one exactly a year younger than me, happened to be flying together. And the younger preacher didn't have the miles that the older preacher had. And the younger preacher had the worst seat on the plane. I will not be graphic, but I will say the worst seat on the plane is the one next to the restroom. Amen. That is the worst seat on the plane. Yes, it is. And this young man, that was his seat. And my friend, because of his miles, was in first class. And it was about an hour flight. And he got on the plane, and he saw the young man back of the plane next to the restroom. Never sat down, Mrs. C., never sat down. Took his boarding pass, went all the way back to the back of that plane, shoved that boarding pass at that young man and said, get out of my seat. You're in my seat. Your seat's up there. I didn't know anything about it. So the young man called crying. And he said, Dr. Hamlin, you ain't going to believe this. He said, Brother so and so's on this flight. He saw me. He was in first class. He gave me his seat. I was next to the bathroom. I said, I don't know if you know it, that's the worst seat on the plane. <laughs> and he was crying. Hey. I said, That's awesome. But just for the record, whenever, see, whenever I see you on a plane, I'm not giving you my first class seat. <laughs> You can be sitting on the wing, I'm not giving you my seat. We're supposed to encourage one another. That's encouraging me to keep my seat. There was a young sailor that was in his first, first battle. And under the fire of the enemy, he, he froze. First battle. Lieutenant saw that and came by the young man and said to him, Courage, my boy. I was just like you in my first Mm -hmm. skirmish. Amen. For the good, the boy recovered. And both lieutenant and sailor lived through that exchange with the enemy. Now, what blesses my heart about that is to see both that officer and young man were under the same enemy fire. The officer took a moment to encourage the young man. You do know there's no crown for being a discourager. I know you've been working at it and you've been trying to get one. But there's no crown to be a discourager. 
pursue. Number three, and last of all, my time's gone. When you don't know what to do, it's amazing to me in that, in that text, question one, question two, they bump into one another. They bang into one another. He, he doesn't even give God a chance to answer the first question. And on the heels of that first question, here comes another question. But don't be critical of them because you've done that too, and so have I. What do we do when we don't know what to do? We pray. What do we do when we don't know what to do? We pursue. What do we do when we don't know what to do? Number three, and last of all, put your life in the path of providence. Verse 9, so David that went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. The believers should put themselves into the path of providence when they don't know what to do. In verse 9, the prophet Nathan tells us that immediately after David gets the green light from God, he gathers his troops uh, and goes out to rescue his family. It's not very long on the winding road of divine uh, uh, guidance uh, that David finds a refreshed guide, a relaxed enemy, a reunited family, a retrieved possession, and a rewarded army. But a person must not miss from this narrative that none of those things would have ever happened if it wasn't for the three uh, word small phrases so David went. Friend, you and I must put ourselves in the path of providence uh, when we don't know what to do. The Bible says in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called uh, according to his purpose. The Christian will never know that what they were up against was for their good if they've never moved one millimeter from the spiritual lazy boy chair that they're in. Friend, you and I need to put our lives in the path of providence when we don't know what to do. Poet put it like this, he maketh no mistake. My father's way may twist and turn. My heart may throb and ache. But in my soul I'm glad to know he maketh no mistake. My cherished plans may go astray. My hope may fade away. But still I'll trust the Lord to lead for he doth know the way. There is so much now I cannot see. My eyesight far too dim. But come what may, I'll simply trust and leave it all to him. For by and by the mist will lift and plain it all he'll make. Though all the way, though dark to me, he made not one mistake. Would you look at the text, 1 Samuel 30, and verse number 8, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? David didn't know what to do. And friend, if you've not been there, you'll be there. Amen. And if you've been there, you'll be there again. I'm closing with this. Mrs. Ortiz is coming to the piano. Last year I was preaching in a jubilee in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. I was to be there Wednesday night and Thursday night. Been preaching in that jubilee for many years now. And before I got to that jubilee, the pastor's granddaughter, Hannah, 23 years of age, suddenly died. They had Dr. C. her funeral on Friday. The Jubilee started on Sunday. I came in, Dr. Tyson, to preach. Wednesday night and Thursday night. So just a handful of days where that Lord's Supper table was, was the casket of their granddaughter. Now just as no parent 
expects to bury a child. That's even more so the case in regards to a grandparent. And no grandparent ever expects to bury a grandchild. But Hannah, 23 years of age, just suddenly passed away. And on Friday, does Steve go forth and his dear wife had the home-going celebration. Hannah was saved of their granddaughter. Came in to preach Wednesday night, Thursday night. I did something that I've never done before, may never do again. But I felt strangely impressed when I got up to preach that night to ask for someone to relieve the pastor's wife, Mrs. Goforth, who had nursery duty that night. I said, I need someone to go get the pastor's wife. She's in the nursery. I said, I need a volunteer. I said, you can't have a criminal background. I said, you can't have a criminal background. I said, you can't have, come on, fellas, I'm waiting for you. You may have a criminal background, I don't know. <laughs> you can't have a criminal background, but I need somebody to help me. The lady jumped up and said, Dr. Hamlin, I don't have a criminal background, and I'll relieve the pastor's wife. I said, thank you. Tell her I, I need her in the auditorium. Been preaching there for years. I wasn't taking liberty that wasn't mine. A couple minutes, here came Mrs. Goforth, and she sat down next to her husband on the second row. And I've never, I've never done this before. Haven't done it since. But I looked at them and I said, Brother and Sister Goforth, I'm a grandfather. I have four precious grandchildren. I have no idea what you're going through, none. But I'm going to preach tonight just to you. I hope others get some help. But I'm just preaching to you too. And that night I preached on the subject, one phrase that'll get you through all the storms of life. I gave the invitation. They came to the altar and the church came with them. And I took the invitation as far as I felt. Brother Ortiz, the Lord would have me take it. And then I turned the service over to Brother Goforth. And as I was coming off the platform, his daughter Katie, 44 years of age, got up out of the crowd and she was going to the platform. We passed each other, Brother Klein. And I went and sat in the front row. And I watched his uh, Katie going on the platform. She, she walked over to the church piano and whispered something to the church pianist. And the church pianist changed the invitation. And Katie said to her dad, who was in the pulpit, she said, Dad, 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 Dad. Finally, brother, go forth. Heard her, turned around, said, yes, Katie. Katie said, Dad, I'd like to sing a song, if he'd be all right, for what our family is going through. But go forth, said, Katie, that'd be great. And Katie started to sing, in the dark of the midnight, have I off hid my face, while the storm howls above me, and there's no hiding place. Mid the crash of the thunder, precious Lord, hear my cry. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Many times Satan whispered, there is no need to try, for there's no end of sorrow. There's no hope by and by, but I know thou art with me, and tomorrow I'll rise where the storms never darken the skies. About that time, Katie broke. She began to weep. And I moved from the front row back to the platform and I put my arm around Katie and I whispered in her ear. And I said, Katie, you can do it. You can do it, Katie, you can do it. She stiffened and dried her tears and sang, when the long night has ended, 
and the storms come no more. Let me stand in thy presence on that bright, peaceful shore. In that land where the tempest never comes, Lord, may I dwell with thee when the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. There wasn't a dry eye in the house. As Katie dedicated that song to her parents at the homegoing of her aunt. I've got to tell you that Katie is what they call, Dr. C, special needs. But really, Katie's not special needs as much as you and I are special needs when we don't put our lives in the path of providence. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.